Thank you all for coming today. Uh, looking out here in the audience, it looks like one of two things happened. Either folks forgot to read the title of the slide or uh, using our gamble of using AI to do an agile title paid off. So don't, don't worry, we're not gonna ask which is the reason you're here. Uh, we're happy you're here anyway. We're going to talk a little bit today about our migration of the RHEL development process from Bugzilla into JIRA. We're not here to tell you how great everything went and what a seamless process it was, because it wasn't. And anybody in the audience that was part of it, you know it wasn't. But what we're here today to tell you about is what we learned along the way. We realize there are seven lessons that we learned at the end of this project, well, at the launch of it, I should say. Um, and we also learned that those seven lessons turned into a replicable framework. And what, that's what we want to share with you today how you can harness the power of change by leveraging these best practices. Uh, so I'm Allison King, along with Rui and Eric. I am a member of the core Agile Systems Engineering team at Red Hat. I've been with the company for a little over three years, and I've been primarily supporting the Red Hat in-vehicle operating system since its inception. And what that means is it's a really good thing that I'm a sucker for good process design. And also, I'm no chicken when it comes to implementing complex change. And hey everybody, uh, my name is Eric Hadley. I've been at Red Hat for about five years. Um, I led the process design aspect of this project. A um, little bit about me, I'm a busy dad. I have two boys and eight girls. These are the girls. <laughs> That's uh, Dragon, Kiki, and Beef Stew. Yeah, Beef Stew, my three-year-old named him. Hello everybody, my name is Rui Ormond. Um, also like Rail, uh, project manager. Um, I like Eric, a project manager in RHEL, and also was involved with several parts of the of the Rich project, or, or um, our migration here that we're talking here with, with you today. And um, well, what's um, unique about me is that I'm uh, often uh, too sorry about things, deeply apologetic. Um, and today, in fact, I almost want to apologize in advance for today's topic. You see, <laughs> the the thing is that uh, the, the the theme has been with me for some years now, uh, on day two of my employment, uh, I was literally br brought into a meeting room on my way to the kitchenette by a product owner who had to brief me on the problem that we have here still four years later, uh, partially resolved, as you will see from today's presentation. And the briefing sounded more or less like this, that uh, we had two, 2,000 engineers working with two tools, at, at one point just one tool, but then in part also with another. Uh, various industry, industry partners we had to collaborate with, and also, uh, well, thousands and thousands of tickets that, uh, well, were, were presented in a flat uh, dimension. It was difficult to find one's bug to begin with, and, uh, well, why should you care? Uh, because uh, this is a typical problem when you have two tools to work with. In our case, at some point, we, as I said, we had Bugzilla and Jira, and it was impossible to have one single source of truth one unified backlog. So we had views like this in which, as I mentioned before, we have a flat display of, of, of the backlog. It's hard to find your bug through infinite scrolling. <laughs> so we had to go from there to something like knowing where your engineering ticket fits into the big picture, where it fits into a product backlog, feature roadmap, product strategy really. And not only that, uh, teams themselves needed a way to prioritize that work, which is easier when, when you know where they fit into the bigger picture, with things like Jira, with the backlog view, as you see here. And uh, then, in terms of execution, Bugzilla didn't really have anything like uh, boards in which you can move cards from one side to another, uh, simplifying the view of what you need to do in any single iteration, if you're using Scrum. Um, and not only that, if you, in turn, use iter iterations, you can uh, know how much you did, and in time, you can calculate uh, something like uh, velocity, which helps you plan uh, in terms of capacity. So, uh, no, and then on top of that, Jira has some more advanced reporting capabilities, such as dashboards, as you can see here. All right, uh, but who's had enough of Atlassian advertisements? <laughs> yes, <laughs> me too. Uh, in fact, uh, we're not here to tell you wh why Jira is so particular or interesting. We're really here to tell you how we migrated, why we migrated, and this is something that, uh, well, led us to think of a name. Well, what name can we think of for this project? As maybe some of you know, this was simple to choose. RHEL in Jira, or <laughs> RIJ for short, Rich, as we say. 
And this in turn became um, a working group, uh, which is something that Eric will tell you more about. All right, thanks, Rui. So uh, the leadership in our program uh, envisioned this working group in 2021. Um, as all the functional groups will come together, we're gonna design this new process, use the tool fit for purpose. Um, so it started out as really a collaboration between project managers, program managers, and uh, reluctantly developers. That was about who we started with. So, okay, we have the working group. We've got a few, a few teams involved. Uh, let, let's go for it, let's do this thing. So we wait about a year. Um, we're, did we migrate you know, to JIRA? Obviously not. So what were some of the problems? We went back and looked at the formation of the working group. Um, There's this question, are there any time constraints involved in this? No, no, no deadline. Maybe that was part of the problem. So take one, uh, we'll be a cross-functional group. We'll use the tool in a way that's fit for purpose with no deadline. So what changed? Um, in early 2022, the VP of our organization, uh, Mike McGrath, he put out a call. He said that we're gonna, we're gonna migrate and we're gonna build RHEL 10 in JIRA only, no Bugzilla. So I'm calling for RHEL 10 and beyond to be JIRA exclusive releases. So that taught us the first important lesson, which is that you need to establish a clear vision and mission uh, with buy-in from leadership as high as you can go. Uh, one of our other project leaders, Josh Boyer, he wrote a note to the community letting everybody know that RHEL 9 was gonna be the last thing that we did in Bugzilla and to expect JIRA to come. Uh, an overly ambitious Wikipedia editor noticed that and added right to the Bugzilla top paragraph that Red Hat used to use Bugzilla until 2022 when we transitioned to JIRA. Not true at all, but we thought it was a pretty good omen for the project. The other thing that that gave us was a milestone. So we knew when RHEL 10 was would development would start is so we could back up. So we had two years to figure out how to do this, this move. Um, that's four minor releases, and we thought we could iterate four times with the process to get it right. So uh, we solved the deadline problem, but was it a cross-functional group yet? Uh, were we using the tool in a way that was fit for purpose? Uh, one of the other biggest risks to the project is that this is Red Hat, and a developer revolt was entirely possible and could have totally thrown the project off. Uh, memo list is a big internal mailing list and we were really hoping that it wouldn't become this huge conversation about why we shouldn't do this. So uh, we had to kind of reform how we got the groups involved and we wanted uh, to take a step back and really focus on the people who would be using the process to design the process. So we had to find you know, documentation representatives who would have cycles to get involved and help uh, developers and QE leads somewhere in this room. Project managers and program managers, we kind of took a step back uh, as a supportive role to help those teams design the process for themselves. And then we had to bring in more groups, uh, product experience, software production, uh, partner groups. And that led us to our second lesson, build a core and expand. So we also did that with the, pro with the project timeline itself. So in the first iteration, we had maybe one team tried to make one change using a simple process in JIRA. Then we brought in maybe a dozen teams, and then we brought in all teams. Um, another good uh, example of, of building a core and expanding, we had this Slack group that has about 360 people in it. Um, it's still active today. We used it a lot while we were building the project, and we built a community of experts who are now able to answer questions um, among the community. So we don't need to answer every single question that comes up, which is awesome. We can actually do something else. So we have a vision, we have a mission, we have leadership buy-in, we have a team. People know where we're heading. We have people to head there. Clearly we're on the happy path, right? Well, we got new teams that are working together for the first time. People from different functions that are being asked to collaborate. And not only collaborate with themselves, but with these cross-functional tools. There's a ton of acronyms here. Uh, that's a Red Hatism in itself, but I'll just give you a sneak peek. One of these acronyms stands for the team that supports Bugzilla. We had to actually convince the Bugzilla team to make some changes to the tool so we could stop using the tool. Pretty easy sell. So uh, yeah, that was, that was a struggle that we had, but we had to really improve our communication and transparency to make sure that we could get the buy-in we needed to move things forward. You know, and like every project out there, we were a unicorn. Any project unicorns in the audience today? Oh, only one, that's impressive. Oh, everybody else follows standard process.
so what that meant was we had to develop relationships with experts across the board, uh, specifically with our JIRA admin team, so we could make changes on the fly because otherwise we'd be slowing down the process and like Eric said, time was of the essence. So we had a lot to do. We didn't have time for the normal storming and forming and norming. We just had to get to work. And on top of that, somebody decided to go on parental leave midway through. So Where did Eric go? Yep, just disappears halfway through this project and we have to keep things moving forward. So that was a really big challenge that we had, but having the transparency to help people understand where we were going was really helpful. But still, this is what the happy path really looked like. Wasn't all that happy and we knew that we had to do better. You know, not only for us, but for the partners that we were supporting. As Rui had talked about, there were a lot of partners, a lot of partner tickets we needed to migrate, and that meant process that went with it, and we couldn't stall partner collaboration because obviously that's part of our business. And at the core of it all was the upstream community. We had to keep them informed, we had to keep them in the loop because they're at the heart of everything we do. We forgot them at the end, don't worry. Rui will tell you how we fix that. So more and more we were realizing that this ridge project was like the Roman Empire. It was vast, it was complex, and we knew now that we needed effective change to handle this takeover. But unlike the Romans, we really didn't want it to be a takeover. We wanted to have buy-in. We wanted the team to be a part of this change. And to do that, we needed to have multiple fora for communication. So took some inspiration from the Romans and started designing communication fit for purpose but it had to be a little bit more modern. So now we have different channels and venues for communication, some for key decision makers, some for those that had to be informed, for some that uh, just wanted to be aware of what was going on. So we were borderline annoying. We were sending out communication left and right, but it wasn't that effective because alone, all of these things were about as useful as an empty calendar. So. We went back to the drawing board and we started with a core. We started with a weekly process working group meeting that included all the disciplines that Eric was talking about before. And there is where we started talking about process design, how to develop POCs, and how to get the teams engaged and to really get their buy-in. You know, from here we started expanding and we added some more working groups. We started sending meeting notes out. It started becoming more of a process as we started to vet all of these solutions, flesh them out, and then bring them back into that core meeting so we could get the feedback we needed to make meaningful change. But a lot of work came out of this. And well, we needed somewhere to track it, so why not JIRA? So you got this group of project managers that are now creating tickets, and we have community uh, folks creating tickets. And by community in this sense, I mean uh, the engineers within Red Hat, creating tickets for things they would like to see. We thought, hey, this is great. We can keep people in the loop. They can know where, where their ticket stands. We can increase trust and transparency this way. That was also a mess. It was a valiant effort. So we added some backlog refinement. And that really helped so we could prioritize. We could really start designing our roadmap in a way that was going to help us simplify and get the most important things done um, as quickly as possible to bring the most impact to the teams. And all of this culminated into what we would call our living guidebook. It was the dev test doc guide in RHEL. And this initially started as a way for us to just document our, our changes and where we're at and become a single source of truth for what this new RHEL process looked like. But because we had started developing a community, something really awesome started happening. It became a place for collaboration too. So we would put things out there and people that didn't usually have a seat at the table were not only aware, but they could contribute. They could ask questions. They could start understanding. And then we'd start cycling this information back into our core meeting. So this became an integral part of, of our entire process. So lesson number three is to build trust, develop relationships, and communicate. Because it's not just about telling people what's going to happen and why it's going to happen. It's about keeping them informed all along the way and getting their feedback. Our process resulted in being one gigantic feedback loop. And I think that dev test doc guide really starts to, to show that and how we start bringing those things back together to iterate and improve the process. 
So how did we actually do it? How did we develop this new process in JIRA? Uh, we had created a cross-functional group. We had a deadline, but now we needed to divide, uh, decide a way to uh, use the tool in a way that was fit for purpose. One of the first questions was, who are we serving? Like, who are our users? Are we trying to build this for the program? Are we trying to build this for executives, for customers? It's the development community. It's, it's dev, doc, test. Like, those were the core constituency that we wanted to have an excellent user experience for them. So we engaged the, U, the internal UX uh, team at Red Hat, and they started doing interviews with, with developers. What do you want out of this new tool? What are the problems that you're having in Bugzilla? We learned that people wanted a simple human process that was easy to understand. We had one governance requirement from the program, so if you make a change in RHEL, we had to track it using a JIRA ticket, but beyond that, it was greenfield. We could really decide what fields, what workflows, how do we want to actually do this, it was, it was open. So the Bugzilla process on the left um, is kind of a picture of what it was. Um, many different acts and gating and back and forth and agreement before you could even start writing a line of code. And what we needed to do was translate that into something that could fit neatly into a Jira Kanban board. Uh, one of the tools that we had uh, was to simplify the process to, is to assume correctness, assume good intent um, as changes come. Um, trust that developers are trying to do the right thing. Uh, we, did, we don't need as much upfront agreement um, because there's many places that we can make sure that bad code isn't actually getting delivered to customers. Uh, we took a minimum viable uh, uh, MVP approach uh, to, to start the process. So this is a famous picture of, uh, you know, don't do it the, the first way where you only get the, the car at the end of, you know, four iterations here. Let's start simple, have something like a skateboard that at least can get you from point A to B. Um, and then we'll iterate until we can have the, uh, the race car that everybody really wants. So we had to have a sandbox, but not a sandbox. We needed to have a production JIRA system that could connect to all of our other production tools so that we could uh, actually submit, get a change into customers' hands. We couldn't do this in staging. Things wouldn't, wouldn't hook up and actually work. Um, and we developed a special relationship with the JIRA admin team to give us some freedom and flexibility to add more fields without having to justify them all, um, add whatever workflows we want that might be against a standard, and then at the end, once we felt like we had a solid process ready to go, then we could um, you know, make that part of the standards. The, yeah, the nagging really paid off there. So we created a project called RHEL X. Uh, we ended up just shortening it to RHEL, but this was the way that we knew that this was the, the new project in JIRA that was going to change, you know, be ready for like, you know, this field to be there today, not be there tomorrow, um, but get involved. So we started really simple, you know, the, the basic to do, doing, done. Can we just start there and see if that's enough? What else do we need to add from that point? And here's an example of how we were able to simplify and assume correctness. So in the Bugzilla days, you used to have to get all these various acts from different groups, and then you'd get another flag set, and then you could finally get something into the release. Um, we realized that we could just replace that with a conversation among the team and, it, and indicate where you would intend to put, a, to put your code change. You like that, 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 <laughs> that equation there? <laughs> Um, one of the other things that we had that's different from Bugzilla is Bugzilla is just a, a flat list of bugs. But in Jira, you had different issue types, and we could simplify what fields show on which screens depending on the issue that you're, uh, that you're working with. And it's also hierarchical, so we could have an epic and uh, nest work underneath it. So we, start, we called uh, for volunteers to join our POC, to start using this process, to realize that it was going to change underneath them, and to roll with it and help us understand how to develop the best process we could. And so our plan was to iterate on the process until teams felt comfortable that they could deliver an entire release using JIRA. Not that it was a perfect process, and we're continuing to iterate on it to this day, but good enough that you don't need Bugzilla uh, anymore to do a release. So that's lesson number four. Imp implement incremental changes in an iterative way. And we applied that to our project timeline as well. So we called the first phase alpha, um, where we were using happy path, um, simple changes. And then in beta, we brought in more edge cases, partner work, different types of work, and then eventually be able to do all the work that we do in uh, the GA, which was the final uh, release before RHEL 10. So this is what the process kind of ended up looking like. It's a little complicated, but it's showing more than Jira. It's showing Jira, GitLab, uh, the Arata tool, um, and everywhere you see a little lightning bolt was automated. So from a user perspective, there were really only a few clicks and a few things that you had to do. 
And so this is the workflow that we ended up with, a planning phase where you did scoping and refinement, prioritization, a development phase where you did your dev test doc, coding, testing, and documenting, and then in a separate integration step to make sure that once all the code was actually in RHEL, uh, everything worked together. It's probably time to go back to the uh, late Roman Republic analogies. Uh, the core process group that Eric and also Allison described uh, functioned a little bit like the Senate of the late Roman Republic. It was somehow functional, it got many things right. Um, like, like was described, the core pieces of the process were uh, well defined via debate, but there was some uh, growing insatisfaction with some peripheral areas uh, or even foundational areas of enablement. So there was this hunger for more and um, it was also, th that's when we also learned that in some regards, it was necessary to execute more decisively or just decisively. Um, in parallel or in concert with the Senate, we had to recruit centurions um, from other parts um, of the Roman Empire. So our Jira devs came on board as well, as did the release engineers and uh, distinguished and principal engineers as well, uh, who had the background of maybe 25 years of, um, ba of uh, Bugzilla development. Everything that was put in place in Bugzilla back then had a purpose, so this had to be reanalyzed re through a Jira lens. And of course, as mentioned, we had to uh, be in touch with the Bugzilla admins who also knew uh, much about that. And uh, well, and in essence, goal was to be conquered. Um, and the, many parts of the Roman Empire were under rule, but some others, uh, such as Gaul, um, had some areas to be still addressed. And like, like Caesar said, uh, Gaul is composed of three parts, and so was our Jira instance. There was a security model in Jira that was lacking. Uh, rel components didn't map yet to teams. So, well, rel components here, I mean source RPMs. It was necessary to have a way to effectively triage uh, tickets filed against certain components by having default contacts. And not only that, our migration procedure well, was lacking. We didn't have one yet. That said, the Senate had some area under control already, uh, the integration with in external tools. So we really had to recruit our legions and start conquering all these areas. Uh, in, in essence, we, at some point, we, we did do that. And when we figured that we had a good enough setup, it was about time to decide if we were gonna march on Rome or not and cross the Rubicon. And that was inherently, again, a decisive um, action because there was, it was a point of no return. Once engineering and QE would uh, move to a different team, uh, to a different tool, uh, so, would, so would all other functions, essentially, as you see here. And um, a decisive action it was, but not a reckless one. Um, coming back to goal, as you, as you can see, there were numerous tribes, some of them even unconquerable. You can think of those as our tickets, that some of the tickets that we couldn't really migrate. And tickets were in general were varied, so we had internal versus external tickets. These had to be addressed differently. We also had tickets that were re related to the kernel, others to the user space. These had to be migrated at different times. And also tickets that are, belong to accounts that are high touch versus low touch. Again, different schedules for these. Um, but well, it seemed that we had figured many things out, the core process and also these other areas of enablement. So what really could fail? That's when we learned that a few months before the migration, we had to adapt to change and put out some fires. I'll do a recap of those. Some three months, four months before the migration, we didn't have a critical process in place for release management, the blocker exception process. Uh, not all partners were aware uh, that of our migrations, especially the low-touch ones, the more numerous ones. Um, the migration procedure that I mentioned was not flawless. It did fail in some steps. We also didn't have a way to provide secure attachments in an otherwise public ticket, something that Bugzilla did. Uh, as surprising as it may seem, not all our maintainers could log in yet to Jira. Some had user account issues to be managed or resolved. And not all developers knew about the new process. Um, Still aren't. <laughs> and not only that, complex as it was within itself, rich, we also needed to tie this back to the release process, the rel release process, and our cadence for minor releases is six months. We have a, about 10 weeks in the beginning of the release cycle in which we can do a, a change like this, a disruptive one. Um, so the situation was a little bit horrifying. It was now or never. We had to think a little bit. Shall we abort mission here? And that seemed prudent. 
Um, after all, we can still repeat it in six, month, six months' time. Um, or shall we persevere and just leverage the fact that the momentum was high, we were getting many things done, we might as well just go across the finish line. Uh, but really, <laughs> the executive call was also a factor. Uh, we were wanted in JIRA by RHEL 10. So <laughs> September 2023 was our deadline. It's easy. It's, well, it, it's, it's put together like this. It's easy to make a decision. So we made a decision. Uh, but you may wonder, now what? The problems are still there, regardless. Uh, so how did we address this? I'll tell you a little bit about that, how exactly we addressed that by describing it in abstract terms. We renewed the sense of urgency, and this was something we saw useful. Well, the timeline was upon us, and many people did raise to the occasion. After all, we could use the call for eight card. Uh, we were reserving it to this moment. Um, <laughs> many of you, uh, even here in the audience, contributed in many ways um, to, to, to get us to the migration point. So we did use that card. And one thing that was useful was to provide everybody with a checklist of things to do to get ready for the migration. It was just 10 items to uh, complete. And that was useful too. It was, was a way to ramp up the engagement. And with that, then we were free to tie off the loose ends of the setup, such as the private attachments, something that Allison put together and still amazes us to this day. Um, and it's the third iteration, but really good. Um, one thing we did learn, uh, lesson seven here, was to never say agile. Uh, after all, what we did really here was to use an adaptable and iterative process <laughs> to adopt a sophisticated and versatile tooling to enable modern and flexible ways of learning. Well, is that to say we were agile after all? This is not the real lesson. The real one is something that Allison will tell you. I mean, it's a pretty solid lesson. I mean, but that's, but that's not what we're here to say. The seventh lesson we learned is that you need to integrate and replicate. Because all of the things that Ruby had just mentioned and all of the things that Eric and I had mentioned up until this point were useful on their own. But when it came time to really cross the Rubicon, we needed to integrate everything we did together to really get this project over the finish line. We had to double down, take a good whole systems approach to everything and put it all together to get things moving along. So having just a mission and vision wasn't gonna get us there. Just building a core and expanding wasn't going to, to do much for us at this point. Trust and relationships, awesome, but what do you have without anything else that supports them? Having incremental changes was helpful. Adapting to change, awesome, great. Being able to make decisions in a, a decisive way was really helpful. But it separately didn't help us get to the end. It wasn't until we started to integrate that we really had that momentum going to help us get to that finish line. And we got there. Uh, come September, this is not a deep fake like the one that Eric had shared earlier on. This was real. We made it. The register picked it up. We felt awesome about it, but we're not here to say, hey, this is a success and now we're done because we'd be remiss to miss the bigger point of all of this is that what we have done is something that can help develop a framework for change across the board. I think it's particularly applicable in an open source culture but really anybody can take the lessons that we've taken or that we've learned and apply them to their teams and projects. Exactly, Allison. <laughs> so, so this is what we had. We had a, a framework that we could repeat that we felt that we could do this again to make more changes. So we had teams in JIRA now, but only in an initial way, that, that process that could get the job done, but we weren't necessarily using the tool to its fullest extent. So we did all of this again, and this is what we're currently doing, um, to, to use the tool in a way that's, that's truly taking advantage of all the features that it has. Um, and we think this is a framework that you can use as well to make successful changes in your organizations. Thank you all. I think we have a few minutes for questions. Jimmy. Yeah, that's a, that's a great question. So the question was, 
did we were we able to use a lot of the standard features that are in Jira, or do we have to do like a lot of customization? I say it was a mix of both, but our our stance was that if there was a standard way to do it in Jira, that's the way we were going to do it. We didn't want to reinvent the wheel. We wanted to use bug story task, for example, as our issue types. We didn't want to create some brand new issue types. We wanted to use a really simple uh, workflow. We did end up putting uh, a couple custom statuses in, and there were you know maybe like two dozen custom fields we did actually have to add. But um, for the most part, it's like if there was a way to do it in Jira, if there was already a Red Hat standard about it, then we'd do it that way. But when there was a you know, not that, we'd have to make something new. That's what we did. Maybe just to add that the goal part was mostly customization. That part of the setup was non-existent, so much of that was, but, but like Eric said, that doesn't subtract from the notes. We leveraged as much as we could from the standard feature set. Now, I don't have anything else to add. I can take another question. So the question is, how high was the buy-in from the leadership, and how do they communicate the mission and vision to the teams? So I'll touch a little bit on it, because I was uh, not there at the very beginning. But the biggest, the buy-in was very large. When it first came out, uh, the whole initiative, the buy-in wasn't all there. It was like this kind of theoretical goal. But once the buy-in came in from Mike McGrath, who is uh, VP of Linux Engineering at Red Hat, we really felt the momentum build, so we really had the buy-in and support at that at that time. Um, from the communication, I'll let you take that one. Uh, yeah, so I'll just I'll just add. So I, I was yeah, not yet. He was still cooking. Um, so so we have a, a two times a year is the current thing. We have a big uh, organization, like all of RHEL kind of gets together. We're calling it RHEL Days right now, um, and so that's like a three half day mini conference that we do. Um, and that's where Mike actually made that first announcement. So he did made it very broadly. And there's you know, emails and stuff after that. But that was the main place where it was uh, announced. They, they didn't. Mike was the, the guy. I mean, I, I assumed that everybody wanted this to happen in the C-suite. There certainly are. We we do, yes. I'm not sure if there was a question. <laughs> Yeah, I, be I believe we are still um, dealing with some uh, things that users may see as regressions, and we're still fine-tuning the setup in order to optimize it. But we have proven it, proven it is possible. There is a lot that can be done in, in those terms. Oh, I see that. Okay. All right, this is an interesting point of debate. Uh, but we have so many questions. Oh, maybe Pirate. All right. That's fair.
No, and like we said, that is a lesson that we learned and we are still refining our process day in and day out and this framework. So that's excellent feedback. And like we talk, it's a feedback loop. We can take that back and make sure that we're doing a better job of communicating. Yes, thank you all very much. Appreciate it. <laughs>